Um, no, this is great. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, Ben. Um, I'm delighted to be here. The caffeine is kicking in, so I'm good for like 15 minutes, right? And then, and then I'm, I'm off. But um, I, what I thought I would do, beca uh, precisely because I've been a little bit out of touch, I, I got back last night at like 11 o'clock from Israel, so I spent a week there uh, doing a number of things, including talking to both folks in the defense establishment as well as folks in, in and outside the coalition government uh, of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, is I thought I would go through a little, we'll end up at sort of the Israel discussion, but I, because time is limited, I thought I'd walk through just a number of things that we need to be concerned about and end up as to sort of where I think we're going. And again, uh, note that I, I spent 22 hours yesterday traveling, so I may not be sort of down in the weeds on the vagaries of the, of the filibuster and what have you, so I'm, I'm looking to you guys to inform me. But here's the uh, sort of the nitty-gritty from, from my perch at the American Foreign Policy Council, which is just a few blocks away. The thing that we're concerned about, and there's a lot uh, of folks who are retired nuclear scientists, retired uh, IAEA deputy uh, chiefs of missions, sort of what have you, who are worried about the intricacies of monitoring, the deficiencies that relate to uh, Iranian verification and the, the secret side deals and whether or not this actually sets the clock tolling if we haven't seen them, right, what have I leave that entirely up to them. My, I'm, I, I tend to be a numbers guy, so when I look at the Iran nuclear deal, I look at the proportional impact that this deal will have. And so you all, uh, I think, understand and you've had the conversation here and in other venues about uh, the scope of sanctions relief. But at least in my sort of uh, amateurish uh, analysis of this, the numbers that we hear bandied about all the time are actually so large as to be completely unhelpful. Um, so it's necessary to put in comparative context. I, I work for a nonprofit, so I don't know from $100 billion. I don't even know from $100 million. But, you know, it's useful to understand what this actually means in comparative terms for the Iranians themselves as well as for everybody else in the region. So um, it's useful to point out the sort of the factoid that I always start with when I talk about this is the fact that last year Iran's total annual GDP was four hundred and fifteen billion dollars. Right? So the Iranian economy is substantially, substantially smaller. It's half the size of Saudi Arabia's, less than half. It's uh, you know, a fraction of what the US economy is. But what you're looking at in terms of near-term sanctions relief, and I think it's necessary to point out that we're talking about near term because we have a six month monitoring period. Uh, by the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, by December 15th, if not sooner, they will certify that Iran has come clean on it, the possible military dimensions of their nuclear program. The reason they'll come clean is because the Iranians will tell them that they're not involved in them because they're not actually monitoring it themselves. And that will set in motion the rapid, large-scale, largely unmonitored release of how much, right? So uh, here's the question, right? So. The president himself in the early going was talking about 140 to 160 billion dollars. He's on record. You can sort of see it on YouTube. Um, the uh, administration now says it's substantially less. Adam Zubin over at Treasury talks about 100 billion dollars. Um, and uh, Jack Lew in his testimony for the House in July said it was uh, less than that. But the re it's 56 billion dollars. But the reason he says it's 56 billion dollars is because Iran actually owes debts to countries like South Korea and China, and Iran is going to be to be expected to pay those from the sanctions relief that it gets. But here's the kicker: there is no intrinsic mechanism by which these guys will get paid first. At least the way the administration is thinking currently, the money, the entire rump sum of money, will go to Iran, and then Iran is expected to pay out to the countries that it owes money to. So. Happily, I'm not a debt collector because my sense is that the Iranians aren't really sort of going to be so diligent about making sure that the Chinese and the South Koreans get paid properly and promptly. Um, but what this does, and I, I sort of I made this comment, I had the privilege of testifying uh, before the House Financial Services Committee in July, and I made a, a sort of an aside comment uh, about the scope of this relief, that what this looks like is a Marshall Plan for the Islamic Republic. And the opposition witness uh, roundly lambasted me. And, and it's, actually, it was a really useful little exchange because it sort of got me along the path of thinking about you know, what it is in comparative terms. So the Marshall Plan, right, it's just necessary to point out, the Marshall Plan was a four-year plan initiated in 1948 by the Truman administration to reconstruct all of Europe, as in 17 different recipients in Europe, right, over the span of four years. And the money that was allocated at that time was $13 billion, which in today's dollars is $120 billion. 
over four years for 17 recipients, right? So what you're actually looking at is not a Marshall Plan for Iran. It is like many Marshall Plans for Iran, right? And, and what this looks like in proportional terms would be as if uh, Germany, who has, which has a $3.8 trillion economy, got $900 billion in sort of uh, expedited cash. Uh, the Saudis got a quarter of a trillion dollars, right? And for the United States, because our economy is measured at, our GDP is measured at $16.7 trillion as of earlier this year, it would be as if we got five times the economic stimulus that strengthened our economy after the 2008 meltdown, about $4.2 billion, I mean a uh, trillion dollars. So this raises the question of what will Iran do with this money? And the administration has been, I think, very cavalier and very flippant about how, yes, they may spend some on bad things, but they're not, you know, mostly it's going to go for the sort of the strengthening of the Iranian economy and domestic infrastructure and all that. But when you think proportionally about what the United States would do if we got a near-term cash gift of $4.2 trillion, the answer would be everything. <laughs> we could do roads and strengthen the defense budget and support the foreign operations budget, right? And you sort of walk through all these things. And that's the way it's being read in the Middle East. Uh, so, sort of when, you know, uh, over the last week when I've had these conversations with Israeli officials and retired Israeli national, secu national security establishment types, this is what they point to. They point to an Iran that intellectually is on the march, uh, which it has been for a long time, but one that for, na for the first time in, in maybe uh, in the 36 year history of the Islamic Republic will, uh, is about to get the resources to actually fulfill its vision. And, you know, that vision actually matters because Iran isn't a status quo power. Iran is a revisionist power. And it wants to sort of change the status quo in its immediate neighborhood, uh, in its favor. And it wants to sort of uh, beyond the greater Middle East, it wants to create a vision uh, that's more compliant with its ideals, with its worldviews, more anti-American, more anti-Israeli. So for the Israelis, they're looking at essentially a two-tier problem. Um, they're looking at a, uh, in the near term, they're looking at a quantity rather than quality problem. So in my conversations with Israeli defense establishment types, the thing they keep coming back to was the teachable moment of last summer, last summer's 50-day uh, Gaza war, in which the Iron Dome air, uh, missile defense system intercepted roughly 90% of rocket salvos coming uh, at Israeli population centers from the Gaza Strip. They that's obviously a huge selling point for Iron Dome. It's a huge teachable moment for missile defense. But for the Israelis, it's a moment frozen in time. Because what they're anticipating is that the trickle-down effect of the sanctions relief will allow Iran to provide substantially more in terms of quantity of rockets. Maybe not sophistication, maybe not yet. But in terms of quantity of rockets that are going to be levied, leveled at uh, the Jewish state by Hamas uh, in the Gaza Strip, by Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. And what this actually creates is an economic attrition dynamic by which the Israelis have to spend more and more money uh, on things like Iron Dome interceptors uh, and follow-on systems like the David Sling, which they've just expedited and supposed to have an operational, initial operational capability later this year, uh, in order to stay in business, in order to essentially match these rockets. The imbalance is inherent because these rockets are cheap and the interceptors to deal with them, to neutralize them, are expensive. And so what the Israelis see coming down the track is an increasingly costly, you know, cost-imposing strategy uh, that results from the JCPOA, where the sanctions relief is going to force them to spend more and more money, and frankly money that they're not all that comfortable spending, um, on defenses in order to just maintain the status quo. Which is why they are expediting programs like David Sling, and also um, they are planning in coming months, and you'll sort of see this play out on the Hill, but they're planning to ask for significant supplemental funds to ramp up production of Iron Dome interceptors uh, because they're, they're ex sensing that they're going to have a capacity problem in, in the near future. Um, so that's in the near term. And in the long term, they're anticipating a quality as well as a quantity problem. So what they see uh, is the same things that analysts here in Washington, um, which watch the Iranian defense budget, see. Uh, on June 30th, uh, before the July 14th announcement of the conclusion of the JCPOA, the Iranian Sup Supreme Leader uh, formally unveiled the, what they call the Sixth de Development Plan, right? Uh, which is sort of their, their national central planning you know, plan, the Sixth Plan for the Islamic Republic, which envisions an expansion of Iran's military and defense expenditures to 5% of GDP. 
um, which will drive Iran's uh, defense budget from its current state of about $14 billion to upwards of $20 billion. And what that will do is not going to be seen in the immediate future, right? It's going to take time for Iran to build additional planes, buy parts from abroad, build additional planes, build boats, do all these things. But the political impact of that kind of military expansion is going to be felt immediately, right? The material impact is going to be felt five, six years down the line. The practical impact is that everybody understands that Iran is on the cusp of a sustained uh, military modernization that may not have an end. Um, and as a result, everybody's sort of gearing up. And, and you can sort of see this playing out in the fact that um, Iranian proxies, like the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, is on a shopping spree. The, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad last week sent a delegation to Cairo uh, itself, uh, a, major, sorry, a major Russian arms client, to buy arms and do things. The reason they're doing this stuff is because they anticipate they're going to have a lot more resources to expand, right, on, on the periphery of Iran's foreign policy, at, while Iran expands its strategic capabilities within Iran itself. Um, and over the long term, the Israelis, the Israelis I talk to at least, uh, believe that what you see coming down the pike is a potential, potentially irrevocable, but certainly a large reconfiguration of regional politics. You're already seeing Iran, sanctions constrained Iran, uh, begin to alter the geopolitics of the Levant through its sponsorship of the Syrian regime, right? We're looking at $6 billion annually in terms of expenditures by a sanctions constrained Iran, right? You're going to look at a lot more in partnership with the Russians now that sort of uh, the economic constraints come off. You're going to look at greater investments in uh, stability uh, of the Shiite variety in the southern Gulf, uh, in Yemen, where the Iranians sponsored a successful coup d'etat against the Hadi government in Yemen. Um, and the reason that's important is because we understand already the harm that Iran can do while it's sanctions constrained. In fact, there was a report here in the Senate last week that, Congress, uh, that uh, Senator Kirk uh, asked from the Congressional Research Service, right, and on uh, sort of Iranian expenditures. And again, the numbers are uh, very fluid. It depends on whether you factor in sponsorship for, for the Assad regime or not. But you're looking at numbers anywhere from $3.5 billion to $16.5 billion annually. Right? And again, you can sort of piece out how much is for Hezbollah, how much is for Hamas, but it's a lot of money, whatever it is. Now think about this. The, think about those proportions. If Iran spends just 10% of its sanctions relief on support of terrorist proxies, it effectively doubles its terrorism budget. So if you like what Iran is doing so far, you're going to love what comes next. Because even a small proportion of sanctions relief allocated to Iran's proxies is going to have a dramatic secondary and tertiary effect on what they can do. And that gets us to, uh, I think, sort of what the next step is here. And uh, I know on the, on the sheet it, it uh, sort of it mentions Europe and Israel. So one word before I stop about Europe. Um, my sense is that for a lot of congressional offices, certainly not all of them, but for a lot of congressional offices, the action over the next several months is going to be relating to constricting available avenues for re-engaging with Iran. Um, and I think that's a huge, uh, huge project because what you see is trade delegation after trade delegation from Germany, from Italy, from France that are circling the Iranian market. They ha are, haven't quite uh, dived in yet because they're getting the warning signs that, you know, there's, there's a tussle on Capitol Hill, but they're ready and they're there. And uh, the sort of the anecdotal evidence is that the, the uh, average cost of a per night stay in a Tehran hotel has gone up, I think, 50% or what have you. Why? Because, well, people are visiting and they tend to be businessmen. Um, and the reason that's important is because the Iranian economy is not a sort of a free market. The Iranian economy is one-third controlled by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, which means that any trade done with Iran is going to strengthen the engine of the Islamic Republic that carries out terrorist activities. And so what you need to do is, as if you're sort of a legislator, is you need to start thinking about how is it, how is it that we can make it more difficult for the IRGC to become enriched. And I think what, that, what you're going to see coming down the pike, uh, not to sort of talk at a turn, but I, I, I think it's reasonable to conclude that a number of members of Congress are going to start introducing legislation to list the Revolutionary Guard Corps as a foreign terrorist organization under U.S. law. Um, not just the IRGC QF. The QF is the, the Special Operations Command of the Revolutionary Guards. Um, 
but the RGC writ large. The you know, and there's a precedent for that. You sort of you go back, the, the SS were listed as uh, uh, at that sort of that contemporary analog of an FTO designation back uh, during World War II by the U.S. government. So there's precedent for this, um, but it's going to be a heavy lift. And it's a, a, an even heavier lift because it's a two-step process. It's not just enough to, uh, to designate the IRGC as a terrorist organization. We need to map the IRGC's economic footprint. And that becomes a much harder task because the IRGC has literally hundreds upon hundreds of companies, uh, affiliated uh, uh, firms, affiliated foundations, um, and they tend to play a shell game in terms of the corporate world. So it's going to be a little bit of, of whack-a-mole, but for those of us that are interested in constricting the possibility that the IRGC will be unjustly enriched as a result of this deal, it's going to be the fight that's going to need to happen here uh, over the next several weeks. So uh, not the only one, for sure, but, but probably one of the most important. So I'll stop there. Elon, awfully impressive for a guy who's sleep deprived and jet lagged. Uh, thank you. Terrific presentation as always. Can I just ask two quick questions? Sure. One, one is a kind of clarification on your last comment. Would it not be the case under this agreement that any such designation would be construed by the Iranian regime as a new sanction and therefore a deal breaker on the deal and therefore to be opposed presumably by the administration which is shilling for them? Uh, I actually, I think that's, that's a great point, and indeed it would be, right? Uh, naturally, we would assume that, that a strict construction of the terms of the JCPOA suggests that if the Iranians want to press the issue, any future sanctions are going to be read in that way as being an impediment to full implementation and therefore to be opposed. Um, I think there's, but here, so let me sort of step back, and, and my sense is that there's a window of opportunity that's beginning to emerge, right? We, we all sort of, we're, on Capitol Hill, we all can sort of read the tea leaves, we all can count, right, we can do electoral math. We know that the deal, uh, however this plays out, something, either this deal or something remarkably close to it is likely to become the law of the land. But what it also tees up is a dynamic in which into the fall you have members of Congress who uh, are going to feel enormous pressure from the American public or from their constituencies to prove that they are still anti-Iran, pro-Israel, sort of pro-U.S. Uh, defense. And that creates an opportunity for a little bit of combative back and forth where you can actually push back against that interpretation. Um, and my, my recommendation is to seize it. Yeah. Um, last question quickly. Um, you obviously and others in the room can talk at length about the particulars of the agreement. I, I just wonder if you might say a word about the idea we've heard a lot of from the proponents that, uh, and in a way you touched on it, but just knowing what you do about the regime, about its ideological underpinnings and ambitions, the proposition that this is actually going to conduce to a better relationship, uh, reintegration into the international community on the terms that I think most people would have us believe would apply. Well, so I, I think that's an interesting point because for all of those of us that sort of the, that have read the agreement and have sort of waded through the 159 pages of, of what is enormously dense lawyerly text, and I'm a recovering lawyer, so I know one when I see one, right? It's intended to obfuscate. It's not intended to, to clarify. Um, you have a sense that the, the administration can say all day long that the deal is transactional. But in terms of the relief, at least, it's transformational. It's intended to create this reset dynamic by which the administration really sort of buys Iran's good favor. Um, and I think, frankly, I, I think that's really presumptuous. And I think it's totally unwarranted. And the way you know this is uh, about two weeks ago, the Iranian foreign minister, uh, Javad Zarif, uh, went public on Iranian television and said, the time is not yet ripe for, to open an American embassy in Tehran. The reason he did this almost guaranteed is that somebody actually proposed opening an, Iranian em uh, an American embassy in Tehran. And he, he had to sort of push back publicly against this idea. And here's an interesting dynamic, because I actually think that that conversation isn't closed, that conversation of diplomatic normalization. Because under the bylaws of the International Atomic Energy Agency, no country that does not have full normalized diplomatic relations with Iran can be part of the monitoring team that inspects Iran's facilities. So the administration can actually lobby for diplomatic normalization under the guise of monitoring, under the guise of verification, and say, look, 
we need to be more stringent, we need to sort of keep a closer eye on Iran's nuclear program, and the only way to do that is to normalize relations, because then they'll let us in, right? It is the diplomatic variant, shh, no, it's the diplomatic variant of what the Pentagon calls the self-licking ice cream cone. It sort of, it sort of perpetuates uh, the desired outcome on the part of the administration. But, I mean, listen, the Iranians get a vote. It's very clear uh, that the Iranian leadership has sold this deal uh, to its uh, more conservative domestic constituencies as being a uh, sort of uh, a deal heavily favored uh, towards the Islamic Republic, that we've pulled the wool over the American eyes, it becomes less defensible in that context if there is a full diplomatic normalization. So if there is one, it's going to be gradual, it's going to be gradated. But remember that in the Middle East, it's not the, the old saying that we always sort of refer to in diplomacy is, right, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But in the Middle East, it's a different saying. It's me and my brother against my cousin and me and my cousin against an outsider. Right? And that's much more of sort of the dynamic that you should think about when you think about Iran being our proxy, because that's really what this is about. The administration is trying to downsize, or as foreign affairs, the current issue of foreign affairs says, right size uh, the American role in the Middle East, and the Middle East is on fire. So we need proxies that can carry our water. And uh, in the absence of anything resembling a, a coherent strategy towards ISIS or anything like that, then we need the Iranians to do this for us so we don't have to do difficult things like think about strategy. Mm -hmm. So my sense is that's a recipe for Iranian hegemony. It's a recipe for American retraction and the loss of American strategic influence. I thought you were going to say for disaster. Well, that too. That too. That too. <laughs> well, an included case. Dan. Among your many expertise, what's the plural of expertise? Expertises? Expertise. Expertise. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, right. Is uh, Russia. I'm, I'm yeah. just fascinated to hear your reaction to the Russian military units that have just landed in Syria, including air forces and soldiers, and what do you expect to see them do, and will they be a threat to the IAF if they attempt another raid on Damascus airport? Right. So my sense is, I, I have a somewhat different view of what sort of what the Russians are doing, because my sense is that it's not binary, it's not related solely to propping up Assad. It's obviously that. It's obviously intended to shore up. So, the line that you hear from Israeli politicians when they talk about it is uh, they have a concept called vital Syria, right? Vital Syria is the center of the country, it's heading from north to south. It's major population centers that the regime has to control in order to stay in power. What they assess is that vital Syria is constricting, that Assad used to fight his enemies outside of vital Syria, and now he's fighting in places like Damascus, right, on the outskirts of Damascus. So if vital Syria collapses, the Assad regime collapses. And so at least in part, the Russian intervention, which is what it is, uh, is intended to shore up vital Syria. It may not sort of reassert Assad control over the whole of the country, but it's essentially to backstop what has been so far, frankly, a uh, Syrian-Iranian effort that's cost a lot of Iranian and Hezbollah lives, but it hasn't really moved the dial in favor of greater stability for the Assad regime. But there's another factor which most people don't think about. The Russians are running up against a very significant radical Islamic problem at home. Um, the uh, Russian Muslims tend to live in, in two pales of settlement, if you could call them that, uh, in the North Caucasus and in the Volga region, uh, sort of to, to the east of Moscow. Um, and the North Caucasus is what we really think about, but more and more you're seeing sort of uh, outbursts of uh, friction between those Muslim communities and the Russian state in all those places, all the places where Muslims are prevalent. The Russians the Russian intelligence uh, officials that I talked to uh, estimated a year ago that they had about a thousand foreign fighters of Russian origin that went from the North Caucasus to Syria. The number they're estimating now is uh, somewhere closer to 2,400. Um, and so th that's a huge contingent. And w one of the problems is about a third of, uh, of all returnees, right, if you listen to uh, folks like Peter Newman from ICSR in London or Magnus Randstorp from Stockholm, they estimate that about a third of all returnees radicalize, right? Not, not everybody returns, right? Some of them get killed, some of them go elsewhere, but of those that return, a third radicalize. So what you're looking at, if you're a Russian national security policymaker, is a potential expansion, and maybe significant expansion, of the North Caucasus insurgency, right? Maybe by half, maybe doubling. And so for them, the best defense is a good offense. They would much rather give Assad the means to kill their jihadis there so they don't have to deal with them at home. That's a very realpolitik strategy. It's a very bloodthirsty strategy, but it's also very effective. 
And so what the Russians are going to be doing there is not just shoring up the Assad regime, but also making sure that the bad guys that have left the Russian Federation have a much more difficult time making their way back. Oh. Not yet, uh, I don't think. And, and again, sort of uh, Israel's main play in Syria is to stand very still so no one can see them, right? So I remember having conversations with Israeli policymakers in which I asked them, I said, you know, wh what's your Syria strategy? Because the temptation to intervene might, must be overwhelming, right? Because you can sort of tip the odds. And they said, yeah, that's, that's really the problem because as soon as we intervene, we become the issue. We don't want to be the issue. We want to sort of let these guys fight it out. So, you know, short of incursions uh, uh, sort of uh, in Israel's north from Syria, the, I think the Israelis are playing a, a very cautious laissez-faire strategy. It doesn't mean that they don't, get an, they don't intervene in certain select circumstances, but I think they want to keep their footprint to a minimum. Sure. With the circumstances that, we, that are emerging, do you believe that there'll be any more interest in space-based missile defense with respect to the nuclear threats? Well, I think it's a good question, and, and sort of to try to marry up uh, Dan's uh, question about uh, the Russians and sort of in that question, the, it took uh, the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, uh, something like seven and a half hours after the signing of the announcement of the JCPOA to say, well, now missile defense is obsolete because you don't need it because you've dealt with the uh, with the Iranian uh, nuclear threat. And our, our administration, to its credit, was quick to say, actually, not so fast, because under Russian support, the Iranians removed ballistic missiles from the table. So now we can actually still have a viable conversation about missile defense. But it does raise some interesting issues, which is that, you know, you have an administration that is at least under pressure to not capitalize fully a European contingent for its missile defense. Um, I think the political atmosphere is such that talking about space-based uh, defenses is, is probably a bridge too far, but the groundwork for it, as, as you know, is uh, space-based research. And, you know, that's something that we can talk about and we can eventually get there. But it's very hard to find a substitute for an executive that understands the value of these technologies. And currently you have an administration that is allowing them to as Thad Cochran would say, allowing them to erode by design. And so you have a problem because we're trying to hold the line on what we have so far rather than build. And space-based defenses is, frankly, a generational leap ahead of what we're doing right now. Adam? Uh, thanks. First of all, I love the Marshall Plan line. Um, great, I'll right? probably be citing you at some point in the column. Like um, but my question actually is about the numbers because um, I've been handing out sheets and I've been trying to figure out some of the numbers. So you said 3.5 billion to 16.5 billion, including Syria, goes to terrorism. Is that what? Right. So that, so there's a, there's actually, and you can sort of find these reports. Uh, they're in the Washington Times. They're in the Washington Free Beacon. Um, you can get the, frankly, you can get the, the, the actual CRS report itself. Yeah, uh, I saw that. Call, if you call the, the Kirk Is that 6.5 billion for Syria that you're talking uh, about? Right, so the administration has said publicly, okay. publicly estimated, um, that it, and Eli Lay covered it uh, a few months ago, that it was $6 billion. Okay. Um, and then, you know, somewhere in there is, you know. So not Syria is 3.5 to 10 billion is what you're saying. Right, and again, the number's a little fuzzy. There are some spreadsheets that attach with the CRS report. Um, and you can sort of parse those out however you can, right? So, so there are discrete facts that are known, pretty well known to everybody, right? So it's $200 million a year to Hezbollah. It's whatever, $12, uh, $12 million a month to Hamas or what, you know, whatever it is. But um, whatever the specifics, uh, that report actually brings you at least some of the way of clarifying what those numbers are. And I think that's important because if you make the case that the sanctions relief is going to have that trickle-down effect, you really need to have those numbers and yeah. sort of compare how they expand. So. And, and just also to clarify some numbers I have, so $10 billion officially to Iranian defense uh, that Iran spends every year, and then I have a $31 billion like defense and terrorism, et cetera. Do both that, of those that, that, that's correct. roughly right. So if you go back and you look at the, the open source reporting, the Iranians were reporting uh, in their press, they were reporting somewhere $14, $15 billion um, previously, before the, the mm -hmm. sixth development plan came out. And then it's not clear where it's going to end up, again, because 5% of GDP is a lot of money, a lot more money than you have currently if your economy grows through, for example, sanctions relief, right? So 5% 5, 5 of an expanded Iranian economy could be a lot of money. 
Uh, so it's not clear where it goes, but it's clearly heading northward. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Elon, thanks for being here. This is a great talk. I'm sure you're really tired, so I'm trying to make okay. it quick. It's all good. <laughs> but um, regarding the, um, the missile question that you brought up earlier, uh, I've done a little bit of research on this for, for Amet, and one of the things that interests me is the possibility of the Iranians utilizing the, uh, what the Chinese are doing now, the A2AD concept, for those who don't know, anti-access area denial uh, strategy, and how their missile program and current arsenal will fit into this regarding uh, the JCPOA and, and what the implications may be. I'd just love to hear your comments on that. That's interesting. And, you know, sort of the, the pushback you would get from Israeli policymakers, if you make that case, would be to say that, that they, even sanctions constrained Iran, has, provide, you know, has, has essentially expanded by an order of magnitude Hezbollah's short-range missile arsenal already, right? So, so it's not that they're going for full saturation. But what they are doing, and this is kind of interesting as it relates to Iran's strategy in the negotiations relating to ballistic missiles, is they are trying to very clearly impose costs <laughs> upon all of the countries that would be adversely affected. So the Israelis are affected by missile, uh, by the provision of missile salvos, uh, additional, or additional missiles potentially to be used as, uh, in salvos. Um, we are adversely affected because the Iranians have de facto, by removing ballistic missiles from the scope of work of the JCPOA, created a cost-imposing strategy in which we have to spend untold billion dollars to shore up conventional and missile defense capabilities in the Persian Gulf, right? So my sense is their strategy is much more insert, and you know, not to sort of wax philosophical here, but if you go back and you look at Chinese strategy, right, sort of Middle Ages, Chinese, uh, Chinese strategy in the Middle Ages, not Middle Ages, Chinese strategy, <clears throat> Chinese strategy in the Middle Ages, right, warring states, all that stuff, that's precisely what you would do if you were a weaker, smaller power fighting a larger, better resourced hegemon. Right? So this makes total sense. I'm not saying this is exactly their intention, right? but it's a m very beneficial uh, ancillary effect. And it's an effect that is even more beneficial when you realize that it applies not only to the United States, but it also applies to Israel. So. Good. Anybody else? Adam? How does the rest of the neighborhood feel about this agreement in, over, the, over there in the Middle East? <clears throat> you know, it's a good question, right? And, and here I think you have to sort of separate the, the rhetoric from the reality. So, for example, no one who seriously studied Saudi Arabia thinks that Saudi Arabia actually thinks this is a good deal. But the Saudi government has publicly said that it's okay with the deal. Why? Because, you know, it has to deal with Washington and it has all sorts of equities involved in this conversation. What I think is most in interesting to watch is the things that these countries do in response. Not what they say so much, but what they do. You know, Saudi Arabia's reignition of this discussion about, you know, buying an off-the-shelf capability, a nuclear capability potentially from Pakistan. Saudi Arabia's ignition of a track two diplomatic process with Israel, which almost assuredly covers uh, airspace rights uh, for overflight, right? And, and sort of, and all this other stuff that's happening on the periphery of the Gulf Cooperation Council speaks to me of the fact that you know, the region is very nervous. The region is, is very concerned by not just the deal, which is, I think, has tremendous adverse effects in and of itself, but what the deal signifies, which is an American grant of Iranian regional hegemony. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I think they're all planning for it. What, what ends up happening, and by the way, sort of one of the things to watch for, if history is any judge, what happened in Iraq um, after the U.S.-led invasion is likely to happen once again, because the, the Saudi response to rising Shiite sectarianism invariably is the sponsorship of Sunni sectarianism. So what you see in Saudi Arabia is the rise of this perfect storm of thinking that perhaps we can counter Iran's geopolitical rise by funding more Sunni extremism. So, you know, I, I think you're in for a very dangerous cycle that's beginning to emerge in the Middle East. To say nothing of nuclear weapons. Um, Ilan, one of the questions that uh, you kind of teased out, but I'd like to make sure I understand how this works, is that the Iranians with this windfall will be in a better position to purvey to Hamas mm -hmm. more, right. if not better quality, certainly better quantities of missiles with which to attack Israel in the next go-around. Given that the 
the crossings from Egypt, as I understand mm -hmm. it, the tunnels and so on, have been largely secured by the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. How do they get them there these days? It's a good question. Uh, it, a lot of it has to do with uh, naval passage, right? So you guys remember back in 2010, the Turkish IHH flotilla and sort of the hubbub over uh, Israeli interdiction and Israeli closure of uh, the Gaza port, right? So that's part of it. The Israelis are obviously watching that very closely. Um, a lot of, I mean, it's an open question. Um, I, I think, you know, there's a difference between intent and the ability to deliver. Um, I think there is a moment of opportunity that the Iranians are looking at because next week um, the Palestinian National Council meets, right? So Mahmoud Abbas, the chairman of the Palestinian Authority, is six years past his mandate. He is uh, old and not well, and there are at least preliminary indications that he may step down. The problem f for us with that is there's no near-peer successor. There's not even a successor, right, let alone a near-peer. Um, there's a series of Palestinian strongmen that are jockeying to fill the void, but in the absence of a clear decision in the Palestinian National Council, Hamas rises in, er, in international prominence, right? And the Iranians are almost certainly going to engage more deeply. So my sense is uh, the Israelis are very focused on precisely this. Um, and one of the most fruitful and apolitical things that the Israelis are doing now is having a conversation with the U.S. government about anti-tunneling technology. Because not all the tunnels are closed, uh, the tunnels that Hamas used to resupply itself uh, in last summer's war. And so the Israelis have found a lot. They haven't found all of them. And so they're looking at technologies that will make them be able to find them better. And the Egyptians are not helping shut them down? Or are they turning a blind eye to some of the tunnels? Is well, it's a, you know, a good question. Sort of, so my, my read from not talking to Egyptians, but talking to Israelis, is that the Egyptians uh, are preoccupied with what's happening internally, because they're having this interesting perfect storm of uh, ISIS in the Sinai, right? otherwise uh, previously known as Ansar Beit al-Maktis, right? which is moving to the west and ISIS in Libya, which is moving to the east, and they're caught in the, sort of in the middle of this rather variegated jihadist threat. Um, so my sense is maybe, but not, not, I think not to Israel's satisfaction. Anyone else? If not, Ilan, thank you. Go get some rest. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>